Now, the title of my talk is not terribly informative, Tertullian and Thomas Aquinas, but you'll see eventually I'll get to a point. Uh, you know, the point is about different conceptions of the nature of faith and its relationship to reason. And I'll have a little bit of time to talk about um, how to appraise these different views in the, um, in the context of 21st century, uh, well, in the 21st century. Now, early Christians were faced with a problem and an apparent contradiction. The problem was this. Check into an inn and pull open the drawer of the nightstand, and it was empty. There was no Bible, nothing corresponding to what we now call the New Testament. What were in circulations for those Christians who could read were a number of Gospels, way more than four, and Acts of Apostles, and Epistles, and uh, Apocalypses, and no crystal clear sense of which were sacred scripture and which ones weren't. The 27 books that would eventually become the official New Testament were not codified until, or made official until 397, when they were ratified at the Synod at Carthage after a great deal of debate and declarations of heresy. So there was no one sacred text to refer to to settle a number of difficult issues about Christian dogma. And I'm going to be focusing on one such issue, as you'll see. But that wasn't the half of it. For what they got from whatever sources were floating around, including those that became the official ones, and from the growing number of people spreading the good news, was a mixed message, to put it mildly. And again, I'm, this is the issue I'm, now that I'm going to focus on as a basis for you know, the, the supposed need for, for faith and, and etc. Here is one message. Jesus of Nazareth was a human being. He was born. His mother was Mary, and his father was Joseph, although there were fraternity questions. <laughs> he was Jewish and poor. He was circumcised, Luke 2.21. When he grew up, he worked as a carpenter. His mother wanted him to be a doctor. But it was another uh, he preached a new religion. He performed miracles. He got angry at merchants and ATMs in the temple of Jerusalem. He got into trouble with the Romans. He was arrested. He suffered horribly and died under torture. And because God loved him, he ascended into heaven. But the faithful also heard a different message. Jesus is the Son of God. People entering now are probably thinking this is the wrong room. <laughs> he existed before Abraham. At the request of God the Father, he became human. He suffered and died for our sins in the most shameful way, horrible. Sorry, in the most shameful and horrible way. He rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father. He and God the Father are one. Well, what was an early Christian to make of all of this? Well, very early on, roughly three positions emerged with a lot of different variations that aren't going to concern me. The first two, and according to Bart Ehrman uh, in his book, How Jesus Became God, these were the first two chronologically. I don't really have an opinion about that. But the first two positions that I'm going to look at tried to make sense of all of this under the reasonable assumption that Jesus must be either essentially human or essentially divine. He could not be essentially both. The first view has come to be called adoptionism. On this view, Jesus was a human being and later was adopted by God, so to speak. That is, he was deified. And ancient Christians would have had examples of this or models of it in, in pagan Greek stories, for example, about Zeus and Ganymede. And in recent history, think Caesar deified, Julius, Augustus, and, and Claudius. Jesus, on this view, was essentially a human being. He was born, he had a beginning in time, and was later made divine by God. But of course, he's not the equal to God. The second view, the flip side in a way, was called docetism. Right? This is from the Greek word dokain, meaning to seem or appear. On this view, Jesus was essentially a divine being. He was not human. 
He was a divine being who appeared before humans in human form. Again, ancient Christians would have had models of this in pagan stories. For example, Zeus did it all the time. Um, Athena appears as a man before Odysseus in the Odyssey. And in the Old Testament, in Genesis, angels appeared as humans to Lot and his family. Now, this view had definite implications. For instance, Jesus did not really suffer on the cross. He was a sort of holy hologram, right? Docetism now proved to be really uh, um, especially persistent among uh, certain intellectual uh, circles. The Gnostic Christians, the Manichaeans, the Marcionites, if these words mean anything to you, these were all heterodox or heretical forms of Christianity that held this view. And we can talk about in the Q&A if you want why they held this view. Um, now, what happened? Who in the end won the Jesus Wars? And that's the title of a very good book on this subject. And this brings us to the third view. And again, on this and pretty much every other controversial issue in the formative years of Christianity, the most counterintuitive or contradictory position became the official orthodox view. That cannot be an accident. And I think it's connected, although I can't explore the reasons for it, I think it's connected to the whole idea of the reverence for faith as something special, some divine cognitive status, radically different from and often in defiance of reason. And that it was important that the faithful have such beliefs. In any case, to get to this third view, the winner, the Nicene Creed was adopted at the First Council of Nicaea in 325 and it remains the defining statement of belief of mainstream Christianity, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestant, and itself was the product of heated theological and philosophical debate. Now, here is the part of it that deals with the nature of Jesus, and if you were raised Catholic or whatever, and you went to, to Mass, you, you can hear the cadence of this probably from your past, right? We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, or the Greek actually says begotten of the Father before all eons, right? God from God, that is God begotten from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being, homo usian, one being or one essence with the Father. Through him all things were made, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made human. He suffered death, that was an important point to them, and he was buried, etc. unquote. Now, the heterodox views would persist for some time, but this one was, as I said, the winner. This orthodox view was being defended as early as the first century, as were the other two. But going back now to that early Christian who booked himself a room in the local saloon only to find there's no Bible, that's a Beatles reference, uh, how was he supposed to sort out this issue? Can reason solve this problem? Is there anything in the books of the Bible that were floating around to help him to settle or you know, figure out this issue? And again, as I said, this is merely one of many of these kinds of issues that had to be sorted out that were seemed contradictory. Well, St. Paul, in his first letter to the Christian community at Corinth, in Corinth, likely less than a, cent a generation after the crucifixion of Jesus, seems to be giving advice on just this issue. And I regard this passage, this is 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2, the end of chapter 1 into 2, um, I regard this as the closest thing to an official, you know, scripture-based statement on the nature of faith and reason, even those, those words, uh, those exact words of the Greek equivalents aren't used. I'm going to be quoting this passage and then interrupting it from time to time with editorial comments. Quote, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the good news, not in the wisdom of reason, the Sophia of Logos, right? lest the cross of Christ become empty. So basically Paul's saying, um, Christ did not send me to give you philosophical reasonings, uh, reasoning the way the, the pagan philosophers do, as to why you should believe this. That would empty the whole Christian salvation story of meaning. 
For the account of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So what he's saying is from the standards of normal human standards, the whole Christian salvation story, since it's not based on reason, is foolish. And the Greek word for foolishness here is via Latin, the root of the English word moron, just a footnote. Um, but they're saying that, and that this is the, the people who perish, that is the people who don't accept the Christian salvation story, um, from their perspective, this whole thing is foolish. But, you know, for those of us who believe, not based on reason, we get the, uh, we hit the, we win the lottery, we get eternal life. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. He's quoting Isaiah from the Old Testament. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in God's wisdom the world did not know God through its wisdom, God was pleased through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. So in effect what he's saying is God's wisdom is revealed truth, which can only be accepted on faith. For is, that is greater than human wisdom, which is what we get through, through reason, uh, right, through the normal means. And it's greater because you can believe it without argumentation, and yet it'll get you eternal life. He continues, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, that is summoned to, to become Christians, uh, both Jews and Gentiles, this is not an ethnic issue, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. What he's saying is, um, Jews have no problem believing in supernatural stuff, but they want a sign. They want a voice in the desert, parted sea, a burning bush, right? They're not just going to believe this stuff. The Greeks want arguments. They want Sophia. They want philosophical reasoning. But we give you none of that. You just believe it. But if you do, it, you, get the, you hit the jackpot. And the last passage, for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the flesh, that is by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no flesh, no living human, might boast in the presence of God, unquote. Now, if you thought Ayn Rand was the first to see a connection between mysticism and altruism, think again. Here is the basis for it in St. Paul, though, of course, with a radically different evaluation. God made faith greater and more important than reason in order to put the wise and the powerful by human standards in their place, to humble them on behalf of whom? On behalf of those who are not wise by human standards or on behalf of those who are wise by human standards but choose, in effect, not to be, um, right? Now, if this is the Christian view of wisdom, then what should we think, or faith, what should we think about, um, no, if this is the Christian view of wisdom, what should we think about the love of wisdom, philosophy? And should we make use of it to settle such issues as the, the exact nature of Jesus? Again, Paul seems to tell us, this time in his letter to the Christian community, the, the Colossians, right? He says, quote, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition and not according to Christ, unquote. Now, given these writings of Paul, if you take them straight, so to speak, and given that these are sacred texts, they're in the New Testament, how should we approach the earlier question of Jesus' nature and many other such issues? You can just rattle off a bunch of them, the problem of evil, the problem of reconciling divine omniscience and, and free will, etc. How do you settle these issues? Well, one pretty obvious interpretation of Paul was articulated early and explicitly by the Roman North African Christian Quintus Septimius Florens Tertullianus. Tertullian, right. His dates are roughly 150 to 225. Tertullian wrote a work called De Carne Christi, On the Flesh of Christ, it was an attack on Marcion, 
Uh, the founder of Marcionism, who accepted docetism, the view that Jesus only appeared human, right? And Tertullian refers to Paul's claim that God chose the foolish things of the world in order to shame the wise. He then says, quote, for which is more beneath God's dignity, more a matter of shame, to be born or to die, to carry about a body or a cross, to be circumcised or to be crucified, to be fed at the breast or to be buried, to be laid in a manger or to be entombed in a sepulcher. You would be the wiser, that is by human standards, if you refuse to believe these. Yet wise you cannot be, by divine standards, except by becoming a fool in the world through believing the foolish things of God, and that is accepting these things on faith. The Son of God was crucified. I am not ashamed because it is shameful. So one of the things the Marcionites and Manichaeans thought was the idea of God being crucified, that just is too much, you, you can't accept that. But he's saying, you know, it is shameful, but I'm you know, not ashamed to believe it. And the Son of God died. It is altogether credible because it is absurd. The word is ineptum, um, it, yeah, absurd, silly, or inappropriate. And I think inappropriate is the least possible. And having been buried, he rose again. It is certain because it is impossible, unquote. So what he's saying in effect is, I am proud to hold what, according to reason, is shameful. I choose to believe what, according to reason, is absurd. I hold as certain what, according to reason, is impossible. Such is the nature and power of faith, of divine wisdom. It even allows for contradictions. Faith and reason will clash, and when they do, a righteous man follows faith. And this view is called fideism, often from fide is, is Latin for faith. In Tertullian's work on the prescription of heretics, he writes that, quote, philosophy is the material of the world's wisdom, the rash interpreter of divine nature and order, unquote. He then describes many of the current heresies of Christianity, in Christianity, which he links in every case to certain pagan philosophers, or to all of them, some to Plato, uh, to the Platonists, some to the Stoics, some to the Epicureans, etc., what about Aristotle? Quote, wretched Aristotle, who invented for these men dialectic, and he means by that logic, the art of building up and pulling down, an art so evasive in its proposition, so far-fetched in its conjectures, so harsh in its arguments, so productive of contentions, embarrassing even to itself, retracting everything, and really treating of nothing, unquote. Philosophy, he says, is the source of, quote, unprofitable questions and words that spread like cancer, unquote. He quotes the passage of, of Paul's Colossians against philosophy and further presents as evident, evidence against it the fact that it leads to a host of different views, what he calls, quote, the variety of its mutually antagonistic sects, S-E-C-T-S, -E right? unquote. He then asked the famous question, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? And he continues, quote, what harmony is there between Plato's academy and the church? What have heretics in common with Christians? Our instruction comes from the porch. The, the word is the stoa. Right? He's referring to the Stoics. Our, our instruction comes from the porch of Solomon, the wise man of the Old Testament, right? who had himself taught that the Lord should be sought in simplicity of heart, you know, not with arguments and all that. Away with all attempts to produce a mottled Christianity of Stoic, Platonic, and dialectic, that is Aristotelian, co uh, composition. We have no need of speculation, a speculative inquiry, after we have known Jesus. No need to search for the truth after we have received the gospel. When we become believers, we have no desire to believe anything besides. For the first article of our faith is that there is nothing besides which we ought to believe, unquote. Now, this view, though accepted pretty fully by a number of theologians, was rejected in various degrees by those early Christians who thought philosophy was proper in order to defend Christianity against pagan attacks and to better understand certain aspects of the faith. 
They, of course, claim to agree with everything that St. Paul said, but on their interpretation, what he said was that one cannot use philosophy to know all of, uh, the, of all of revealed truth, nor can you use it to overthrow the articles of faith. That is a genuine danger on their view. But it still has its uses as the handmaiden servant of theology, just as reason is the handmaiden of faith. The early Greek Christian thinkers like Origen and Clement of Alexandria would count as such philosophers, as would the better known ones writing in Latin, uh, Augustine and Boethius. Though all of these figures kind of, they differ somewhat on a continuum as far as their respect for, for faith or, or reason. Now I next want to look briefly at Augustine on faith as the Augustinians will be in control when Aristotle arrives on the scene, or you know, the works of Aristotle, arrives on the scene in the Latin West in the 12th century and gives rise to the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas in the 13th. On the one hand, and it's no surprise, Augustine rejects the pro-reason outlook of the pagan philosophers, which he associates with pride and arrogance, especially in the face of revealed truth, which can only be grasped as an act of faith. Further, as a Platonist, he rejects the value of the evidence of the senses in spiritual matters. He compares the senses to a swarm of unclean flies buzzing around his face, his head, preventing him from realizing, for instance, that God could be an incorporeal being. He, he tells us that he owes this to the Platonists. On the other hand, Augustine rejected the fideism of Tertullian, for he held that philosophy, reason applied to spiritual matters, was natural and good and can properly be used to better understand revealed truths, right? though never completely, of course. But this limited praise of reason was not an invitation to use reason and science in secular intellectual pursuits. As he writes in the Confessions, and note the fascinating connection he makes between sexual desire and the desire for knowledge. Quote, there is also a certain vain and curious longing in the soul, rooted in the same bodily senses as is sexual desire, which is cloaked under the name of knowledge and learning, not having pleasure in the flesh, but striving for new experiences through the flesh. This longing, since its origin is our appetite for learning, and since sight is the chief of our senses in the acquisition of knowledge, is called the, in the divine language, the lust of the eyes, or the concupiscence of the eyes, unquote. It's because of this outlook that, on the one hand, there is such a thing as medieval philosophy before Thomas Aquinas. But it's also why medieval philosophy by its nature is almost always theological, and why it led to no advances to speak of in the special sciences or in technology and human prospering. With Thomas Aquinas, rough 13th century, 1224 to 1274, we get a much better defender of the power of reason in harmony with faith, of course. For him, reason was arguably not the mere servant of faith. It had a limited autonomy of its own. Thomas's fullest account of the relationship between faith and reason, Fidis et Ratio, can be found early in the first book of his Summa Contra Gentilis, on which I am teaching a course for the OAC next year, although we're supposed to call it something, the um, ARU, right? Um, I'll be teaching a course uh, next year. I can only sketch his view here, book one, chapters three through uh, seven. Now, the first point that he makes, and he merely asserts this, is that there are two kinds of truth concerning God, those that can be reached via reason and those that exceed the limits of reason. Right. His example of the former is that God exists and is one, unum, that there exists a God and there's only one of them, right? An example, uh, and that he's a unity. And the example of the latter is that God is trinum et unum, right? He's triple and single, or he's three and one. That's the trinity, right? So right away we see, we'll be charitable and say, a tension uh, in his examples. God is three in one, that's a belief we accept on faith, and God is one, what he claims reason can demonstrate. So we should be suspicious about this whole idea of a harmony between the two, I think, from, from the outset. 
Now, note that this is a typical way of arguing for faith to begin, and way beyond Thomas Aquinas, I mean, it's, it gets in William James, and, and well, certainly Kant is the expert here. Um, that is to begin by limiting reason. As Lord Henry says in Oscar Wilde's A Picture of Dorian Gray, skepticism is the beginning of faith. And to his credit, he's, he's, he's criticizing both of them, you know, skepticism and faith. But what justification does Thomas provide for limiting the scope of reason in this way? First, all knowledge, he believes, is based ultimately on sense perception, right? He is an Aristotelian. We can thus reason from the effects of God, from the existence and nature of the universe, to God as the creator of that universe. But this does not get us anything like a complete no comprehension of God's nature and his plans. They remain mysteries. So we can know, for instance, that God exists, but there's a lot about God and other spiritual matters that are beyond us. Second, we should not assume, Thomas says, to be false what reason cannot prove. Now, this is kind of sloppy on Thomas's part. I mean, yes, we may under the right epistemological conditions claim that something isn't false even though it cannot be proved true. We might say it's, depending on the evidence, it's possible or probable or conversely that it's worse than false, it's, it's arbitrary. But that's not what Thomas is claiming. He is claiming that there are certain things that are inherently unknowable and our inability to know them via sense perception and reasoning cannot automatically count against believing in them. And this, in fact, is the primary reason we need uh, faith. I'll mention for those of you who are fairly new to objectivism that Ayn Rand rejects out of hand as contradictory the notion of the inherently unknowable. But even granting Thomas this much, why does it justify faith? Why not instead be an agnostic, or in his case, since he claims we can prove the existence of God, a deist? Now, I'm sure there's a non-philosophical reason for this, but I'll stick to what he argues and presents in the Summa Contra Gentiles. What he does next, however, is argue that it's proper to accept on faith what can be known via reason. Why? Well, first, because otherwise few men, philosophers but not peasants, right, would have knowledge, cognitio, of God. So he's implying here that faith is like knowledge, though elsewhere he says faith reside somewhere between knowledge and, and opinion. Second, because otherwise those who can discover divine truth via reason would accept it only after a great deal of time. And what the, the model here is someone like Thomas who embraces it from the beginning and then works to understand what can be understood through reason. Third, faith is justified because the possibility of error is built into reason which can lead one to corrupt the articles of faith. Quote, that is why it was necessary that the unshakable certitude and pure truth concerning divine things should be present, presented to men by way of faith, unquote. We are instructed by God, he says, quote, to hold by faith even those truths that reason is able to investigate. In this way, all men would easily be able to have a share in the knowledge of God and this without uncertainty and error, unquote. If you're like me, this brings to mind a line from Galt's speech. Accept that an error made on your own is safer than 10 truths accepted on faith, because the first leaves you the means to correct it, but the second destroys your capacity to distinguish truth from error. Back to Thomas, though. Now, even if we grant that it is often proper for people to accept on faith what others have demonstrated by reason, why is it ever proper to uh, accept on faith something that cannot be established by reason, something inherently unknowable? That is, given the importance of reason, which Thomas as an Aristotelian recognizes, why, if we are rational, should we accept anything as true that is not supported by reason? How could such faith-based belief ever be justified. Now, it is to Thomas's credit, in contrast to Tertullian, that he does not expect people, or at least not philosophers, to accept something on faith without there being justification for belief based on faith. Quote, 
We must therefore prove that it is necessary for man to receive from God as object of belief even those truths that are above human reason. Now, he argues in a couple of different ways. First, he combines the point he claims to have made already, that there are truths that reason cannot establish, with the fact, as he sees it, that humans have a natural desire to discover what we don't already know, and that, and that we are directed by God towards this higher good. If this sounds circular, it isn't, he says, because he will later prove that there is a God who has so directed us to believe things beyond the reach of reason. But that'll come later in book three, I think. Now, Thomas next presents consequentialist reasons uh, in support of faith. That is, he argues that it is that it's that its benefits are the that faith is a good thing, that there are benefits to believing things based on faith. Now, only one of these is worth mentioning, and it is a horror. Quote, I mean, it, you know, Thomas is admirable in some ways, of course, but here it is. Quote, another benefit that comes from revelation to men of truths that exceed reason is the curbing of presumption, which is the mother of error so that the human mind might be freed from this presumption and come to humble uh, to a humble inquiry after truth. It was necessary that some things should be proposed to man by God that would completely surpass his intellect, unquote. And this is Thomas's version, I think, of God has made foolish the wisdom of the wise. He next to, turns to a problem plaguing anyone trying to prove the validity of faith. Once you've claimed to have de demonstrated that faith is valid, what reasons can you possibly give for favoring one set of beliefs based on faith over another? For instance, why isn't accepting Christianity on faith epistemologically the same as accepting Islam on faith? Or anachronistically, once the case has been made for faith, why isn't faith in Mormonism or the Heaven's Gate cult or Scientology all equally permitted as faith, as faith in Christianity and specifically Catholicism? How can he simultaneously claim that many of the Christian articles of faith are beyond reason and that reasonable people ought to accept these beliefs rather than any others? After all, the articles of faith of every religion are beyond reason. Now, the first point to make is that what we do know about God via reason rules out some things that we shouldn't believe in based on faith. He says polytheism, for example, because he can prove there's only one God, whatever. But, well, you know, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but uh, it's hard. Uh, but beyond that, as a Christian Aristotelian, um, he's in a bit of a bind, right? He needs to present empirical evidence in support of the one true religion, the dogmas of which are beyond the reach of sense perception and reasoning. And this is, in effect, what he does. The evidence he presents are all accounts of different kinds of miracles, right? They do not prove the truths of Christianity, but they indicate that it is that this is the religion that it is reasonable to accept of all the religions. This is the one a reasonable person ought to accept on faith. And he mentioned four kinds of evidence of this sort. The first are miraculous cures of illnesses and the raising of the dead. And he refers to the miracles of Jesus and the apostles that were witnessed by the gospel writers and by Peter and Paul. This is the rock-solid 1,200-year-old you know, anecdotal evidence, right? He also has in mind miracles that continue to be performed by saints and reported by witnesses. So you may not be able to prove that Jesus is both essentially divine and essentially human, and that's beyond the grasp of reason, but there is empirical evidence that Jesus was a human who did miraculous things and that this religion surrounding Jesus is the right one, okay? Second, Thomas says that there exists simple and uneducated people that are inspired by the Holy Spirit, quote, to possess instantaneously the highest wisdom and the, ready, uh, and the uh, readiest eloquence, unquote. 
In his treatise on separate substances, Thomas writes that, quote, there are manifestly certain works which cannot in any way be reduced to a corporeal cause. For example, that people in a trance should speak in a cultivated way of sciences which they do not know, since they are illiterate, unquote. Now, we don't, he doesn't give examples that I'm aware of. Maybe he has in mind someone like St. Uh, Anthony of the Desert, who was known for being illiterate but also very holy. I'm not sure. Later examples would be Joan of Arc or Greta Thunberg. Um, third, third bit of evidence is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, right, um, as outlined in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there's a number of prophecies made about the, the Jewish Messiah, and Jesus fulfills them all, and that's got to count for something, right? Four, and he says, this is the clearest sign, and it's, there's something interesting going on here, and I don't think he's playing it straight, but it's, it, it is interesting. He says, The clearest sign is the fact that Christianity thrived and ultimately succeeded despite tyrannical persecution and without force of arms and without the promise of pleasure, appealing not only to simple minds but also to the wisest people. There were a number of early philosophers who converted to Christianity. Moreover, not only was there no promise of pleasure, Christianity teaches contempt for the things of the world. And yet, you know, people lap this up, right? That's got to be, that's, it's a miracle, right? Um, and Thomas, in this connection, and there's some evidence that he wrote the Summa Contra Gentiles as, as part of the need for an apologetics for Christianity against the Muslims in Spain. And at this point, he explicitly mentions Islam, which promises pleasure and succeeded through force of arms. They expanded military, through military conquest. We Christians didn't do that, and that's a sign of, you know, we didn't need the help of of an army. He's claiming you can raise certain questions about that. Now, the last thing that Thomas does in presenting his account of faith is to defend the harmony of faith and reason. They can never clash, he says, contra Tertullian. And if you were to ask him about what about God is one and God is three in one, he would cast it in such a way that the three-in-one is beyond the reach of reason but can't contradict what reason can tell us. He says, quote, the truth that human reason is naturally endowed to know cannot be opposed to the truth of the Christian faith, unquote. Only falsehood can oppose truth and contradictions, he says, cannot exist. The truth of Christianity and the truths established by reason both come from God, Who gives us this faculty of reason? If God had implanted contradictory truths in us, it would hinder our intellect. And, quote, such an effect cannot come from God, unquote. So you never have to choose one over the other, he says. Accepting what is absurd or impossible according to reason is not a mark of supreme faith, but a sign that one has misused reason or misinterpreted scripture. Thomas's views on reason and faith are sometimes presented or often presented using a Venn diagram. Imagine two overlapping circles. One side represents the truth that can be reached by faith. The other side, the truths that can be demonstrated using reason. And they overlap. And this overlapping area represents those beliefs which it is proper to believe based on faith and can also be established by reason. And the fact that there's an overlap, he thinks, shows that faith is grounded in reason. Now, Thomas is very often, if not usually, more concerned with reason corrupting faith than with faith corrupting reason. And I think in that sense, he he really is very much a medieval. Quote, whatever arguments are brought forward against the doctrines of faith are conclusions incorrectly derived from the first and self-evident principles embedded in nature. Such conclusions do not have the force of demonstration They are arguments that are either probable or sophistical, and so there exists the possibility to answer them, unquote. Now, in fairness fairness to Thomas, it is noteworthy what he did in at least one important case in which reason in the form of Aristotle seems to contradict the Bible. Aristotle argues that the universe is eternal, but the Bible seems to say that it isn't, you know, creation ex nihilo. Thomas concluded that reason cannot decide this issue, 
though of course he accepts creation ex nihilo on faith. He actually wrote, to his credit, he actually wrote a work called On the Eternity of the World Against the Murmurers. And the murmurers are the Franciscans and the, the Augustinians. Thomas tries to show that accepting both the world has always existed and the world was created by God is not necessarily incoherent, though, of course, he does not claim to have demonstrated that both are the case or even that either is true. His approach to this issue is somewhat different in the Summa Contra Gentiles because what he aims to show is merely that it is not against reason to believe in a creator God, which is what faith demands. Belief in a creator God cannot be established by reason, but neither is it contrary to reason. And that's good enough for his contradiction, uh, his Freudian stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's enough for his conception of faith, and it doesn't involve embracing a contradiction a la Tertullian, because Tertullian, if he were to discuss this issue, would say, you, you could imagine him saying, yeah, reason says the world's eternal, but the hell with that. I'm, my faith is so strong, I'm going to accept the, contradict, you know, the contradictory. Now, in its cultural context, 13th century Europe slowly emerging, slowly emerging out of the Middle Ages, his conception of reason and faith was a crucially important move. Thomas was, in effect, arguing for the autonomy of reason, at least in its own realm, and that it was proper and important that humans pursue knowledge in this realm. And at least by implication, because he didn't stress this, that they apply it to their lives on earth. This was a strike against the Tertullians and the, Augustin, the Augustines in the church, a groping for some realm in which reason here on earth could thrive. As Ayn Rand puts it uh, in, for the new intellectual, quote, philosophy in that era existed as a handmaiden of theology, and the dominant influence was appropriately Plato's in the form of Plotinus and Augustine. Aristotle's works were lost to the scholars of Europe for centuries. The prelude to the Renaissance was the return of Aristotle via Thomas Aquinas, unquote. And incidentally, I gave a course, well, two lectures uh, called Aristotle and the Renaissance, where I talk, I say a great deal about Thomas and, and I praise him. So there is some place where I do praise him. Um, that needs to be said, given what's coming. Uh, similarly to, to the Ayn Rand quote, uh, Leonard Peikoff uh, explains in Opar, quote, reason, Aquinas taught, is not a handmaiden of faith, but an autonomous faculty, which men must use and obey. The physical world is not an insubstantial emanation, but solid, knowable, real. Life is not to be cursed, but to be lived. Within a century, the West was on the threshold of the Renaissance, unquote. Be that as it may, to paraphrase Mark Anthony, I come to bury Thomism, not to praise it. The evil that philosophies do lives after them, unquote. Now, that might be a bit harsh. I think it is. But in the little time that remains, I want to argue that in the modern post-Enlightenment West, the Thomistic conception of the relationship between faith and reason broadly understood is even more dangerous than Tertullian's. Why? Well, in, in respect to Tertullianism, let me paraphrase my favorite line from Hitchcock's Notorious. We are protected by the enormity of its irrationality for a time. I'm not denying that the Tertullians of the world can be dangerous. Evangelicals, Christians denying evolution, fundamentalists and terrorists of all sorts, uh, anti-abortionists, right? And the legions of ignorant all over the globe who lap this stuff up or passively accept it. And certainly even today, if this were Iran or Saudi Arabia, I would not be making that ca the case that Thomism is more dangerous, but then I wouldn't be in a position to make any case at all. In what sense, then, is Thomism more dangerous? To use the language of Ayn Rand's The Anatomy of Compromise, quote, when opposite basic principles are clearly and openly defined, it works to the advantage of the rational side, unquote. And that's the situation when a rational outlook, objectivism, opposes faith according to, to Tertullian. Right? It's just so obvious. However, quote, 
When they are not clearly defined, but are hidden or evaded, it works to the advantage of the irrational side, unquote. And that's what, maybe I shouldn't call it Thomism, but that's what the very modern view that reason and faith are, can perfectly um, uh, be in harmony, right? It works to hide or evade the irrationality of faith. This was not Thomas's intention, not primarily, to give ammunition, so to speak, to those who wish to hide or evade their irrational beliefs behind a, uh, a cloak of you know, an apparent respect for reason. And we certainly cannot blame him for it. In his cultural context, he is a hero. Nevertheless, this is what the purported harmony of faith and reason does today. It works to the advantage of the irrational side. And I think it's clear that when Ayn Rand discusses faith in Atlas Shrugged, she mainly has in mind something like this, not the Tertullian, but this harmony of faith and reason view, not, I think, Thomism itself, by which I mean any view that holds that reason and faith can live in harmony in the same mind. She is addressing modern men, not monks. When she says the alleged shortcut to knowledge, which is faith, is only a short circuit destroying the mind, she doesn't have in mind a follower of Tertullian, so to speak. That mind is already destroyed. And the same is certainly true in the crucially relevant passage, this crucially relevant passage from Galt's speech. Sorry, I'm going way over, but there'll be some Q&A. Uh, quote, whenever you committed the evil of refusing to think and to see, of exempting from the absolute of reality some one small wish of yours, whenever you chose to say, let me withdraw from the judgment of reason the cookies I stole or the existence of God, let me have my one irrational whim and I will be a man of reason about all else. That was the act of subverting your consciousness, the act of corrupting your mind. Your mind then became a fixed jury who takes orders from a secret underworld whose verdict distorts the evidence to fit an absolute it dares not touch. And a censored reality is the result, unquote, etc. There's a lot more important stuff there. The fixed jury taking orders from a secret underworld whose verdict distorts evidence to fit an untouchable absolute is unfortunately, unfortunately a perfect description of what I'm, the view of, of faith I'm talking about here. And it's a perfect description, unfortunately, of the cognitive state of most people. We often speak of Thomism as, as a synthesis of Aristotle and Christianity, but such a synthesis is not really possible, not in the long run. Thomism in an, original, in an irrational medieval culture worked to carve out a safe space in which reason could flourish, and that it could flourish in that context is a testament to the power of reason and the impotence of evil. Today, in a post-Enlightenment context, what amounts to Thomas's view, as, a, as I've described broadly, has functioned to carve out a space in which one's own designated special irrationality is considered untouchable, not to be challenged. But what that space includes is fundamental philosophy, including ethics. Thanks. And it is growing. For what I'm talking about describes not only the dogmas of Abrahamic religions, but the tribalism and religiosity of the culture more generally. For instance, it characterizes how most people on the left hold their environmentalism as a dogma not to be questioned. And when someone like Elizabeth Warren says, I believe in science, it sounds to me very much like someone reciting the Nicene Creed. But then so do people on the right whose view of Trump as a great statesman and defender of the ideals of America is equally impervious to reason and empirical evidence, which mount, seem to be mounting every day. Uh, in absolute, they dare not let their reason touch. Now, there is much more that I could say, but I made the mistake of asking for a 60-minute session rather than a 90-minute session, so I better end here so there's some time for, for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mayhew, for the fascinating talk. If anybody has a question, just please line up by the microphone here. Hi, my yes. question would be, you're bringing up at the very end the cultural impact all the way to today, chasing it from Aquinas, or at least chalking it up to Aquinas. Like, who would you say today is like separating reason into one space and then faith into another space? Like, who is like the modern day Aquinas to you? 
That well, the the real champion of this view, the one who set it in stone in a way that uh, Thomas never did, was was Kant, of course. But most uh, any philosopher who regards um, religion as something perfectly appropriate and consistent, you wouldn't hold it against a person that they're a Muslim or a Catholic. Or whatever. That's untouchable. Um, anyone who holds such a view. Uh, I mean, William James, I and mean, that's not really recent, but there's a lot of people in the philosophy of religion who they want to argue that um, in one form or another that there are, there are certain truths that can't be settled through reason and that there are legitimate reasons why people want a set of beliefs that we could call religious. The difference between them, I think, and Aquinas is they don't try to show that this is the one view. They would never want to claim that being a Christian or a Buddhist or a Muslim, one of them is better than the other. It's all good, right? And it's not. Um, but so I can't really think of, I'm only just now starting to get into uh, the literature and the philosophy of, of religion uh, on, um, you know, defenses of faith and stuff. So no one really comes to mind. And it's sort of unfortunate that um, I'm picking, I'm using Thomas as an as a example here. But partly I did it because I'm working on Thomas um, a lot at the moment. But partly because I think he's... Um, He's a kind of quasi-hero, and I don't want to find feet of clay because they're not feet of clay. They're a really important part of who he is. There's some real flaws here, and they ha have to be identified. Um, there's, there's some greatness, too, and I, I focus on that in the, uh, in the lectures I give on Aristotle and the Renaissance. Um, yes? Yeah, I just have a question about uh, St. Augustine. Um, I've read the Confessions, and I found it a fascinating document because on the one hand it has you know these really toxic christian things about you know as you said like science is concupiscence of the eyes or something like that yeah concupiscence or lust we say yeah that. yeah and um it has all of those really toxic things and then there's this like long passages about memory is really amazing it's such an incredible thing we have or uh like he's very very searching about himself psychologically and is really trying to get at issues or like, oh, you know, like people make fun of us about uh, what was God doing before he created the world? And we respond, we Christians, saying, um, oh, he was making hell for people who ask questions like that. And his answer, and he says, no, this is a real serious question. We as Christians need to answer this. So he's got this really toxic side, but there seems to be something really honest and searching in another part of him. Like, what do you make of his character? Because I, I just find it so bizarre. Well, he kind of displays his character in a fair amount of detail in the confessions. Well, no, he, um, he's not that bad of a guy. I mean, he, he's not like that big of a sinner. Well, he's, um, he's struggling as to whether to be a Manichaean or a Catholic, and it's really tough. And um, uh, uh, on the other hand, sex is really important. It's an easy, evil urge, but I have it a lot. So, um, you know, God grant me ch chastity, but not today. Uh, <laughs> And then so he knocks someone up and, oh, but I'm going to be a good Christian. So he leaves her aside and go, you know, no, I don't, um, I don't want to talk about his character. I don't find there's much of uh, admirable there. He is a philosopher, and I made that point, and I think you're right. In the later uh, chapters of the Confessions, he, he has interesting things to say, uh, philosophical things to say about memory and time, and, and he has a view of history, and, well, that's more elsewhere. Um, but then so do all these early Christians, um, particularly the ones who existed before Christianity became official, because they actually had to respond to pagans who were making fun of them. So they get into origin as a very interesting guy in the Greek tradition. You know, he, people are arguing, you know, pagans are making fun of, you know, what was God doing before creation? And he has a story to tell or arguments. They don't work, but they're at least there. It's an attempt and it's, there's a great respect for pagan philosophers there. Um, yeah, I would say Augustine was a brilliant mind. I think he, I mean, he wasn't a doofus or anything like that. He was quite brilliant, but I think I wouldn't separate the toxic stuff and the philosophy. I think you have often brilliant philosophy brought forward in support of the toxic stuff. Um, but I don't, I, I mean, I'm fascinated by these guys. Um, I, I think there's some real philosophy there, and it's worth studying and studying... Um, in detail, um, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, and just, just one other quick unrelated thing from the last point. Um, do you have opinion about James Valiant's creating Christ? 
I haven't read it. I, he asked me to read it, and I, I told him I'd read the first hundred pages, and I gave him some feedback. Um, so I don't. I, I'm, I tend to be suspicious uh, of attempts to try to claim that it was all a conspiracy or something like that. I find it very strange because, I mean, very early on, someone like Irenaeus was, you know, less than a generation after Jesus is writing all these stuff, these things in defense of of the proper view of Christianity against some of the wrong views I, I was mentioning early. And the idea that, I don't know, I just find it hard to, to reconcile that sort of um, early emergence of discussion of Christianity with the idea that it was some Roman plot. Um, but I haven't read the book, so I, I really can't. Um, and I would add, though, I don't think it matters. I mean, if you could make a slam dunk case, this this was all a Rome, the, who are the Flavians, that they all, I wouldn't change anyone's mind. What, would half of 1% of the Christians in the world maybe give further thought that there might be reasons to doubt it? Um, there's absolutely no reason to believe in God in the first place. So the fact that there might be a conspiracy, I don't think it's going to change people's minds. But um, if now you, know, you have me on record of, of avoiding an opinion on it. <laughs> Uh, yes. Hi. Um, aside from Aquinas, the other uh, superstar thinker who's admirable in some ways is uh, is um, Pierre Abelard. Pierre Abelard. Um, could you, I, I, could you say that? Abelard. Abelard. Yeah, he's an interesting guy. That's could you sure. contrast his take on reason and faith versus Aquinas and and his view on? No, no, I'm really not qualified. I used to know more about Abelard, Abelard than I. Um, that I know now. I don't want to say I used to know an enormous amount. You know, I've forgotten more than most people know. I'm not saying that at all. Um, but I, I mostly know him in in regard to Heloise and and Abelard, and and he's my second favorite of the two. Um, Thank you. Uh, but he was, uh, yeah, he had interesting things to say about universals and all that. Um. He sometimes said that uh, early modern physicists and astronomers were motivated by their religious belief in searching for mathematical regularities in phenomena. And presumably this could be used to say that there is a value in being a Christian or a, or a Jew in that you persist in searching for those laws if you believe that God and you implanted them there. Um, would, would, you, uh, would you agree with this idea? Because to me it seems that a, a religious person is looking for rationalizations, not truths. And on the other hand, it seems that the history does suggest that people like Kepler were motivated by deep uh, religious commitments. Oh, yeah, I would agree with the position, the rationalization point you made. Um, I, um, yeah, oh, but certainly Kepler was, he had religious motivations and, and Copernicus did as well. And um, Newton, I mean, a lot of these people were, were deeply religious in their own way. Uh, so I don't really have more, more to add about that. I disagree with the idea that there's something noble in religion because it's a certain, you know, it's a search for fundamental uh, positions. I think that only is valid if you're talking about primitive, pre-philosophical human beings. And there, there's a reason why um, they, they create uh, religions because I think you have to crawl before you walk and walk before you run and, and you can't start with philosophy, although it's a deep human need. But... Uh, um, do we have time for one more? Okay. Okay. Um, um, my question is: is if if it's not because I, I think um, people like uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, couldn't you say that maybe um, not even that they're not uh, limited to his time? They were good people. Maybe they're also good people now, uh, because, for example. Uh, I, I study a lot about economy, uh, economics and I'm, I'm very much into Austrian economics and a lot of people that follow Austrian economics, they criticize Friedrich von Hayek because they say later in his life he made a lot of concessions to uh, uh, the welfare state and stuff like that. So he uh, also had, he, he wasn't only for free market capitalism, he was also for welfare state and stuff like that. But I think a person, for example, like Friedrich von Hayek, he would be more able to convince a very extreme socialist than, let's say, some economist who's only laissez-faire and 
not for any welfare at all. So is I, I think, there a place for this in between? I, I think I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I think that was actually true in the Middle Ages. That is, I think Thomas succeeded where the radical Averroists uh, couldn't succeed because they, they went, they were an idea, a set of ideas whose time, you know, it, they were, um, their views were banned in a way that uh, uh, Thomas was as well. But um, uh, yeah, so I'm, um, I wouldn't say, in fact, I was hoping that my talk was suggesting that that can't be the strategy in the 21st century of, well, you're going to turn off too many people if you come out as a radical pro-reason, anti-faith, so why don't we have a mixture? No, I think the mixture is exactly what I'm trying to to um, combat here. However, the first point you mentioned about decent people, I'm not making any claims mm. about it's impossible for a Catholic to be a nice person or something like that. The more decent people, I think it's impossible to have to be perfectly, fully honest and hold some of these views. But I think there are people out there that have these views, and the better ones are the ones that we hope um, might see the light. <laughs> and yeah, I would Thank end you. on that note. Thanks, Dr. Robert Mayhew. Thank you.